They got engaged like this. In Dublin, they went to a house party, then walked home along cobblestone lanes. Celine was 26 and Luke was 28. He was tall and lean and dark haired. She was tastefully ugly, square face, flat black sandals. Although the night was warm, she had gloves on. They discussed two of the guests who'd broken up. I don't think they spoke to each other all night, Celine said. Honestly, they should have ended it sooner, Luke replied. How so? I mean, breakups always suck, but they suck less if you end it while you still like each other. They strolled left onto a street of terraces. Celine turned the key in the red panelled front door and together they clambered up the rickety communal stairs. Their two-room flat was in number 23, a subdivided Georgian townhouse. At the bathroom sink, Celine removed her black leather gloves and rubbed in hand cream. She was a professional pianist and moisturised only at night to avoid smearing lotion on the keys. Then she joined Luke in bed. She resumed the topic from earlier. No one ends a relationship while they still like the other person, she said. You think, OK, it's bad, but it's about to get good again. Then it keeps being bad till it's over. Decide up front, Luke said. What's the worst thing they could do where you'd still like them, but only just? That's your limit. And if they do it, then leave. Celine turned off the bedside lamp. So what's your limit? In theory. I mean, it sounds old-fashioned. Luke paused. But if I thought we'd never get married, or that level of commitment, if I knew that wasn't going to happen, then... Yeah. In theory. When you say it won't happen, who's decided? I didn't say that. If you're a mind reader, you know that's going to cause way more problems than it solves. I didn't say it won't, Luke trailed off. I mean, but it won't, though. Marriage will never happen between us. And that's not a problem necessarily. It will be silly to stop when it's going well. But we're not going to end up together. A pause for which Salim felt responsible. The cat mewed from the next room. Celine said, at last, if you really think that, we should break up right now. No response from Luke. She added, by your own criteria. Silence. But, Celine said, sometimes you say things because you want me to contradict you. And it's fine if you don't and you want me to agree. Still no answer. Tell me what to say, she said. Say what you want. I guess one of us has to. Like, I think back a lot to when you said you didn't want a relationship. And I said, eventually I want one with someone, but not a guy I've just met. So for now we're good. Then later I said, if you still didn't want anything serious, we should stop. And you said you changed your mind. Sometimes I think you'd always wanted to be with me. You just couldn't acknowledge it until I did. Another pause. If I need to say things aloud before you'll even say them in your head, Celine said, then that's not my favourite quality of yours. It's not an aspect I'd bring to a desert island if I could only take three. Actually, I find it impossible picking only three things. Probably I love all of you. And I think for me that means I want to be with you forever. Then Luke asked. Everyone else wanted the wedding in Dublin, but Aunt Maggie preferred London. So London it would be. Celine was from Dublin and had never lived elsewhere. Luke had grown up in London, but his parents were Irish and he'd moved back to the old country three years ago. Dublin seemed obvious. Celine wrote, Dublin, in her little black book. They still wound up setting the ceremony in London. You use the engagement party to sort the guest list. Aunt Maggie told Celine from her London landline. Tell me if there's a racket, I'm dusting the birds. The birds were Maggie's Waterford crystal swans, plus a few outliers, hawk, eagle, pigeon. Uncle Grelin had once made the mistake of buying Maggie a Tipperary sparrow, the species Maggie could accept, but it had to be Waterford. 
Maggie had married Celine's uncle Grelham when they were young London Irish immigrants in the 80s. They had no children of their own, so Maggie was forever bothering her two nieces. Through the success of their plumbing firm, Uncle Grelin and Aunt Maggie had bought a massive house in North London. Meanwhile, Celine and Luke's Dublin square footage was a luxurious 80% of the legal minimum. Maggie's opening gambit, we'll host the engagement party. Fair enough. She had the will. She had the space. In this way, Maggie got her inch. Next came the mile. When Luke got home that night to number 23, Celine told him, I've done a terrible thing. She patted the cushion and Luke joined her on the couch. She told him. He said nothing for a while. Then, we can work with that. Are you sure? Celine said. I know you wanted the wedding in Dublin. I mean, if London makes you happy, Luke said. It'll make Aunt Maggie happy, Celine said, and that'll make Uncle Grelin happy, which will make my mother happy, and they're the people I'm getting married for. Besides you. And one other, I guess. Yourself? The cat. As if on cue, Madame Esmeralda sunk her teeth into a mouse toy, carried it from the windowsill and dropped it on the couch. Luke petted the side of her face. You're too kind, he said. Merci, madame, for the gift. But the second thing, Celine said, we have to invite Maria. This time, Luke was speechless. Six years ago, Celine thought Maria was the greatest love she'd ever know. The August after their final exams, they started renting an apartment even tinier than the one Celine would eventually share with Luke. From there, Celine and Maria began their careers as professional pianists. Celine's dream was to earn a living through concerts alone. Maria craved prizes and La Scala and record deals. Back in reality, they both took pupils to pay the bills. Celine played for playing sake. Once she begun learning a new piece, she gave herself over. She started with the hardest passages, so that by the end they'd be the bars she played for fun. There was only time to physically practice five hours a day, but she never stopped mentally rehearsing. A black and white keyboard inhabited her brain. She played it while scrubbing dishes, queuing in little, and riding the bus to students' homes. Her cerebrum's running score left no energy to speak. Not even to Maria. For Celine, this was bliss. You can't say you don't want to talk to me and not say sorry at all, Maria said in the entrance hall after Celine had emerged from a week-long list coma. Could you not just apologise? They had this fight roughly once a month for three years, but when it was good, it was the best. Sex, for instance. Celine had long seen orgasm as physically beyond her. She'd never climb Everest. She'd never kayak. She'd never come. Her male partners had sportingly borne this limitation. The sex toy argument was another of Celine and Maria's staples. It'd take me out of the moment, Celine said one night in October. OK, Maria said, but it takes me out of the moment when I'm the only one who comes. Can you at least try a vibrator on your own? It won't work. I've tried everything except the thing I'm suggesting. It won't work. Then, after two years of dating and four months of living together, they went to Japan. Celine was playing at a competition. When the judges announced that Celine had finished third, Maria muttered to Celine that the winner had been lethally inoffensive. Selim replied, third is good. Stop ruining third for me. That night, they returned to the hotel room. I have an early Christmas present for you, Maria said. It appeared to be a mint green stress ball in a little glass case. Selim took it out and squished it in her hand. Cute, she said. Thank you. That's really... Oh. It buzzed. Two minutes. It took two minutes. She could forgive men everything but this. If their relationship had consisted solely of sex, Celine would have married Maria. The problem was everything else. After years together, they needed strenuous effort to communicate. Each felt she made herself unhappy for the other. The relationship was always going to end, but the breakup still hurt like hell. 
After they parted, Celine could still make herself sit down and play piano. But the keyboard in her head disappeared. Someone had closed the lid. She lumbered along Dublin's rainy streets. Each step was slower without her internal soundtrack. Celine didn't date again until the summer. She knew she'd be lost for a time. And she was, until she met Luke. Explain to me once more, Luke said in the sitting room at number 23. I mean, explain to me, like I'm a child, why we need to invite Maria to our engagement party. The cat jumped onto the windowsill and kneaded Luke's books as if braiding bread. Celine turned her head to Luke. Aunt Maggie's one kind of middle-aged Irish woman. She's military efficiency. She's Prussia. But my mother's more into soft power. And Maria's parents live on her road. Are we inviting everyone on your mother's road? Luke said. There's neighbours and there's neighbours. The Burks are neighbours. Right. We need to invite your bad ex because these neighbours aren't just neighbours, but neighbours. She's not a bad ex, Celine said. She's just an ex. And she won't come. Of course Maria came. I didn't think you'd come, Celine said and made to hug just as Maria went for a cheek kiss. Are we hugging? Maria said. It was the first time they'd seen each other in months. Were you in London anyway? Celine said. I've moved here, Maria said. Where's Luke? Uncle Grellen's Hampstead house was called The Birches. It had three stories, a red brick facade and two white pillars. Floor to ceiling shelves featured no books, no plants, and many Waterford swans. Luke's somewhere, Celine told Maria. There are a few others you'd know. Tanya, Roe, Jack, Grania. She and Maria stood by the staircase. She pointed to their old conservatoire friends who sat outside the dining room. And Phoebe's in the garden, badgering people for smokes. Celine could see her 22-year-old sister through the back window. She expressed herself with her usual tragic comic range of gestures and was most likely being rude about Luke. Phoebe had never taken to him. She was difficult like that. But where is Luke? Maria asked again. I was hoping for a heart to heart. You'd need to have one for that to work, Celine said. They both laughed. You're talking to me, Maria said, out of everyone you could be talking to. So I can't be that bad. Brava, Celine said. You've won the engagement party. I'm in the lead. I still need to find Luke. You know, I've barely met him. Celine had last seen Luke around 8pm when she'd been looking for her camera. She messaged him. He didn't reply. He tended to float off and he'd never been much of a texter. She knew that and for the most part she accepted it. But did he have to do it tonight? Trust Archie to arrive at the engagement party near midnight. Archie was Luke's best friend, so Celine had to tolerate him. But cokehead lawyers were a virus best contained. Archie stood in the doorway, a champagne bottle in each hand. He must have rung the bell with his elbow. Good of you to come. Celine let him in. Let's get these in the fridge. Since the champagne was for Luke, who disappeared from the party. He still hadn't replied to Celine's text. I think Luke's taking a work call, she improvised as Archie followed her down the steps. A work call at his engagement party? Archie whistled. The boy's in demand. Archie made room in the fridge for the champagne bottles. Then he straightened up and said solemnly, Between us, I'm already tight. Locked, as Hibernians phrase it. Luke often said that Celine and Archie should be great pals. She still wasn't sure if it was a prediction or a decree. Everyone's drunk, Celine told Archie. Vivian's here, by the way. And Sean. Vivian and Sean were the friends Luke and Archie had lived with in London after university. Luke had dated both Vivian and Archie when they were all Oxford students. 
So best set Vivian on Archie and Archie on Vivian and leave them to it. Also, Sean worked for Goldman Sachs. So into the playpen went he. No further reason for hating Sean and none needed. The whole gang, Archie said. Celine was glad to see Archie go upstairs. Archie gone. Ambrosial. It was true that Luke hadn't replied to her text. It was also true that she'd just seen Luke's name pop up on Archie's phone. But life was beautiful. Four glasses of Chardonnay later and Celine was genuinely happy. It's herself. The voice belonged to Celine's mother. Bridget wore a cameo brooch, an ornate flourish on her otherwise austere gestalt. Everyone's asking after you, she said. What a crowd. You must be thrilled. Her tone was diagnostic. Bridget had an Irish mother's suspicion of happiness and a doctor's reluctance to grant a bill of health. I'm surprised so many came, Celine said. Ah, no, her mother replied. What? Don't be giving me that. Bridget always thought Celine was giving her this, that, these, those, them. I really don't know what you mean, Celine said. Sure, they're curious, Bridget said. What about... Mr. Wright? They've heard so much. From Bridget. They'd heard so much from Bridget. This was Celine's mother's problem, of her own creation. They'll meet him in time, Celine said. Will they? Bridget scrutinised her daughter. Where is he? If Bridget seemed tense, it was because her own marriage had failed. That wasn't Luke's fault. Celine loved having him in her life. In the half-year singledom between Luke and Maria, Celine's music had suffered. She didn't need daily chatter, but she hated having nobody to hold. She was a simple enough creature, and did better with kisses than without. Besides, Luke helped her with chores and bills. That wasn't a romantic proposition on its own, having someone handle her life admin. But when it was Luke, who listened, who cared, she wanted him forever. Uncle Grellan helped Celine eject the last few guests from the birches. Would it be a long drive home you've there now, boyo? His face had reddened over the past few hours and his voice was husky from pleasing the crowd. Under his breath, he said, Is it coffee himself is off getting? Who's himself? Celine said, though she knew Grellan meant Luke. Grellan regarded coffee as Luke's shtick, his light motif. He seemed to think nobody else drank it. When Celine had mentioned last year that Luke was bisexual, Grelin had replied, Ah, there you go. Then, seeing Celine's bewilderment, the coffee. Celine was still unsure if Grelin had meant bisexuals were apt to enjoy coffee. Bisexuals were merely likelier to disclose such a preference should they have it. Or coffee made one in fact bisexual. It certainly made one anxious. I don't know where Luke went, Celine told Grelin. Her uncle resumed kicking out the guests and Celine looked around the front hall. Her sister Phoebe was nowhere to be seen. She'd come out with some rubbish earlier about going to look for Luke, but she was probably smoking cigarettes in a ditch. Aunt Maggie, in her leopard print dress, bickered with Celine's mother, Bridget, by the staircase. Grellan was the only McGaw to be relied on. But he couldn't fix everything. She needed to talk to Luke. In Celine's first two months of dating Luke, he did the following. Mentioned frequently that he didn't want a relationship, then kept coming back to continue not having one. Took eight days to text, can't do wed but free through. Accused Celine of having the wrong friends. I mean, do what you want, but... Gronia? Accepted invitations to meet Celine's flatmates, sister Phoebe, etc. And then always had a reason he couldn't come had sex with Grania and didn't tell Celine. And fine, they weren't exclusive. But why did it have to be Grania? And then when Celine asked, why didn't you tell me? Luke replied, I mean, the information doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot for you now. Celine vented about the Grania thing to Tanya, another conservatoire friend. Tanya replied, but why do you keep dating him? Tanya was a sensible person. And she wasn't showing you a Simpsons clip from 1998. So this take on matters convinced Celine that something should change. The conversation with Tanya happened on Saturday. The following morning, two months after Celine's first date with Luke, 
she took him to a large relaxed brunch place in the Liberties. If you want a date, we can date, she said. If you don't, we stop. I've just been through a bad breakup and I don't want stress. So we date each other properly or it's over. The waiter chose this moment to bring their Americanos. Once the man had left, Luke lifted his cup and drank. This is good coffee, he said. And I do want to date you. So he did. From there, things improved. Yes, she'd pulled her hair out over him in the first couple of months. But didn't everyone at that mad early stage? What mattered was her potential. She'd seen it on their first date. Their exchange about talent. He'd believed what most people refused to. She wasn't driven by praise. She made music and the making was enough. Nobody else seemed to fathom that a woman might find the work itself more compelling than the social approval that followed. If he could believe that, if he had the imagination to see her as she was, then that was enough. She wanted nothing, really, hardly anything, just to be known. But maybe somewhere along his lengthy chain of misdemeanours, she should have dumped him. Sorry for not texting, Luke said. The party was over and he'd finally phoned. Celine lay on the bed. The guest room was pitch black, so Luke's voice felt like something she could see. It was warm as well, in colour and in heat. It was safe. I got roped into a meeting first thing tomorrow, Luke continued. They flew me back to Dublin. I tried to say goodbye, but I couldn't find you. Anyway, just in the door. Madame Esmeralda's asleep. She trusted his voice. It was odd, though, that Madame Esmeralda was asleep. Their cat was usually a nectophilic little demon. Before Celine could mull further, Luke spoke again. Tell me about the compliments, he said. And what went on in your head? Damn him. Actually, I couldn't do a lot with the compliments, Celine said. There wasn't much process to unpack. It was, well done, Celine, you're marrying a man. And I don't know how I did that. You proposed. And you said yes. Luke, Celine said. His paws registered awareness that the mood had changed. Celine continued. There's something I want to ask. Sure. I texted you and you never replied, Celine said. And then later I saw texts on Archie's phone. Texts from you? Oh, Luke said. Where was he going with this? He added, I think probably what happened. Ah, one of those. Those were her favourite, where Luke talked about technology. What must have happened, Luke said, is I'd sent Archie those texts earlier, but they only got delivered after I'd left. Your uncle's house is near the tube station. Yes, it was just, you know. I wasn't texting anyone. Rushing to make the flight, airport by 12, boarded at half, and now, Jesus, 2am. You must be wrecked. Anyway, I'm back. And cat's asleep. No worries, Celine said. Between night and love you, Celine heard something in the background. A slammed door. Must be the cat. As the sun rose over the birches, Uncle Grelin lifted Celine's suitcase into the car boot. With the gods on our side, we'll make it, he said. Celine hoped so, since they were leaving at 6am to catch a noon flight. Now you might be a wee bit early, Grelin added as Selim fastened her seatbelt. But get tea. And he handed her a ten pound note. When she was a kid, the tea had cost a pound and the rest was for being his niece. I found out where Luke went, Selim told Grelin. He's back in Dublin. Had to leave early. Work meeting. On a Sunday? Yes. Busy man. Grelin swore under his breath at the perceived incompetencies of fellow drivers. Listen, he said. Is everything... Celine ignored the question. Did you enjoy the party? I did. Your man Luke. You'd be pressed getting a word from him, Grelin added. Luke talks loads when it's just him and me. Grelin examined the sat-nav again. 
Driving seemed to distract him from his general need to fill silences. As long as you're happy, Grelin said. And as long as he pays us half. Celine and Phoebe were the closest thing Grelin and Maggie had to children. For Maggie, this gave her an all-encompassing need to control her niece's lives. Grelin confined himself to statements of what the girls were owed. Make sure he doesn't leave before the vows, but... Grelin added, them priests to be frustrated as it is. It wasn't him. Celine sipped her tea from a paper cup and squinted at the man who wasn't Luke. Black coat, black shoes, that could be anyone. Queuing at an airport news agent. No, this scenario is too dreary to be his downfall. If he insisted on ruining both their lives, he owed her an anecdote at least. The queue advanced. It was his turn to pay. His head turned by enough degrees that she could no longer deny he was Luke. Maybe he'd been planning to surprise her. Or his midnight flight had been cancelled. But why had he told her on the phone that he was already back in Dublin? There was no explanation. She'd have to trust. Like she'd done when he'd seemed unusually affable with her conservatoire friends. Not just Grania, but Tanya too. Like when he spoke to Archie and Vivian every week, in spite of having slept with them? Because... But she'd trust. She'd given him the benefit of many previous doubts. Had spent the whole relationship doubt-benefiting. Was an old hand and veteran, a major league doubt-benefactor. And basically knew the process and was fine. And if she stopped trusting, she'd lose her march. The church's organist would never hammer out Mendelssohn's chords. It would be goodbye to the flat at number 23 and to the cat and to all the life she knew. She didn't want that. So she'd trust. Phoebe wanted Luke in the sun. She wanted World War I to happen again so they'd send Luke into the Somme. Earlier that night, Phoebe hadn't been able to find Luke at the engagement party. Shifty bollocks. Tall but Should have been easy to spot him in a crowd with a thick English head in him. If he wasn't pricking around upstairs while the rest of them got landed with Grand Aunt Bernadette. But there was Celine, Sitting next to the piano in the corner of the blue room. Phoebe would ask her in Irish. That way, if Luke overheard, he'd feel left out. Call Will Lagar soon, Phoebe yelled. Celine looked up from the wing-back armchair, wine glass in hand. Sorry? Call Will Lagar soon. Phoebe, that's French. You what? Garçon is a loan word, but le is just straight up French. You're an awful swat, you are. Phoebe sat down on the arm of Celine's chair and took a swig from her sister's wine bottle. Where's your bitch bastard fiancé? Would you get a glass, Celine said. I'm not drinking your drill. Same jeans. My drill is your drill. And yelling it in English defeats the purpose of initially, I'm finding him, so I am. Phoebe gave a noble nod. I'm finding Luke. Why exactly, she couldn't say. To throttle him, maybe? None of Luke's friends could confirm he'd left the engagement party. Phoebe tried her mother next. Bridget replied, Would you stand up straight? I am, Phoebe said. Straighter. You've not seen Luke. Phoebe scanned the entrance hall of the birches as she climbed the spiral stairs. No Luke. Plenty of people she could ask for a cigarette. But Luke first. In the upstairs hall, she paused at the window and saw him. Uncle Grelin had found Phoebe a job two years ago and she was still there now. Grelin's friend Jimmy Coughlin was upgrading his Irish pub to gastro and needed a girl to serve the food. Phoebe had stayed with her uncle initially then moved to a cramped flat chair after getting her first paycheck. She had survived to age 22 with only the usual signs of wear. Mild nutritional deficiencies, self-diagnosed anxious attachment style, self-diagnosed avoidant attachment style, Stiff neck from excessive phone use. She googled things like wildfires Europe and heat wave crop failure famine and when will Dublin underwater and why am I lonely and why do I hate existing and 
how much carpet cleaner to dye? And why won't the government let me dye? Besides all that, her current problem was Luke. He tried to be pals the first time Celine brought him home for Christmas. The year before, when Phoebe was 18, she'd met Celine's girlfriend Maria. Neither McGaw's sister had ever formally come out to the other. Celine had known for years that Phoebe was a lesbian, but Phoebe only realised Celine was queer when her sister casually mentioned Maria. It hadn't been a shock. Phoebe tended not to assume anyone was straight unless they were really in your face about it, which in fairness, a lot of them were. No, Phoebe only felt she'd lost the run of things the following year when she saw what her sister had moved on to. Since their father's exit when Phoebe was eight, the McGaws had formed new Yuletide traditions. Bridget hated cooking and board games, so they ordered Lebanese and completed a puzzle of Oprah Winfrey's face. On Luke's first McGaw Christmas, he kept asking Phoebe stupid questions. Celine told me you work in Shoreditch, Luke had said. In a gastropub, Phoebe said. Luke drizzled tahini on his falafel. Our London office is in Shoreditch. Maybe I've been to your pub. The customers are pricks, I can imagine, Luke said. He could not imagine. Who did he think he was? By the way, Luke added, can I ask about the Oprah puzzle? Uncle Grelin had bestowed it many Christmases ago. None of them knew why, but suddenly Phoebe was certain that it was the perfect gift and that Luke showed his ignorance by even questioning it. She'd never liked him. Then, a few weeks after that first Christmas together, Phoebe saw Luke in a bar with that German girl Celine had studied piano with. Tanya? Yes, Tanya. The sight of Tanya and Luke wasn't indutable evidence of wrongdoing. But by this point, Phoebe had spent a year working in Jimmy Coughlin's gastropub, playing all its seedy denizens with booze. She could tell on sight when the riot was imminent, winning to go that pair. She didn't tell Celine. Phoebe talked a big game, to herself at least, about not letting anyone mess with her sister. But she was a Hippocratic at heart. First, do no harm. She couldn't see what good would come of ratting on Luke. But he couldn't make her like him. By the time they announced their engagement, Luke was nothing short of a tragedy. When he vanished at the party. A farce. And when Phoebe peered out the window in the upstairs hall and saw Luke walking down the road with Maria. Psalms that way. Sorry, but we're all out of helmets. Phoebe's interests didn't always align with those of Archie, Luke's lawyer friend. But at the engagement party, one important thing had changed. Phoebe knew Luke had left with Maria, but not where they'd gone. Archie did not know Luke had left with Maria, but could possibly track them down. Archie, Phoebe said. She found him on a sofa in the front room of the Birches. I'm wondering where's Luke? Archie waggled a finger. Not to be pinned down, ah, Luke. Archie, Phoebe leaned in. You won't believe what I'm about to tell you. I don't believe anything. Nor should you. She didn't have time for this. Archie, she said yet again, and grabbed his wine glass. What's that for? Listen, or I'll break the head in you. I saw Luke leaving with Maria. Who's Maria? Phoebe explained. Right ho, Archie said. He did a fair bit of that, talked ironically plummy. Can we find them? Phoebe said. She now knew her real motive. It wasn't just that she hated Luke. She wanted proof so clear of his many evils that she could do the impossible. Tell Celine. Text him, Phoebe said. Text him what? Text. Where are you, you poxy bastard? He's not going to tell me. But Archie sent it anyway. Poxy. Are you Macbeth? Close. Phoebe said. I'm Dublin. I doubt he'll reply. But Luke had responded. Big hotel just off Hampstead High Street. Hang on. Luke shared location. Honestly, come save me. I'm in worst conversation of my life. Phoebe, could I... Luke said. She narrowed her eyes at him. They stood outside the hotel restrooms, having left Archie and Maria at the bar. Phoebe had said she needed to pee and Luke had followed her out. Phoebe and Archie's ambush had yielded the desired result. 
They'd reached the hotel and found Luke and Maria in the lobby. The pair of them sat in front of the reception desk, both wearing smart casual blazers. Maria's lipstick was smudged. When Luke saw Phoebe and Archie, his hand jerked up to ruffle his hair. The whole thing was shifty as hell. But Phoebe wouldn't tell Celine. Besides, Phoebe still couldn't prove Luke had cheated, just that he and Maria had gone to a hotel. Phoebe could already hear Celine's response. How sweet of them to scope out a venue for the reception. With all this in mind, Phoebe had followed the others from the lobby to the bar. Now Luke wanted to talk outside the jacks. Could I? Luke said again. Here, most people would find the pause painful and say something. Phoebe did not. So he continued. I should explain. Grant, Phoebe said. About being here. That's clear. We're here because you've got something to say. I want to piss, so let me know when you're done talking. Honestly, Luke said, there are things about my relationship with Celine that I won't get into, but it's best not to tell her I'm here. Grant, I won't, Phoebe said. Can I go? There's context, but if you can trust that everything's okay between us and it makes sense in the overall scheme of things and if you cannot tell Celine. I'd appreciate it. There are lads at MI6 who talk straighter than you. Phoebe, Luke said, promise me you won't tell Celine. Luke, you can't get me on your team. You lied to my sister about this thing and probably lots of other things. I just don't feel like telling her. So if you've said all you've wanted to say, I'd really like to piss. Now Luke's voice changed. Right from the start, Celine thought you had something against me. I'm family, Phoebe said. I'm allowed opinions. I'm also, would you believe it, allowed to piss. In pursuit of the same, Phoebe left. When Phoebe emerged, Luke had already rejoined the group. At a round table by the door, Maria leaned her elbows across the marble as if to claim possession. Archie and Luke held their drinks in their hands, perhaps fearing she'd knock them over. The real question, why had Maria sneaked off with Luke? As Phoebe turned the bloody thing over in her head, Maria complained to the group about her rising success. She touched up her lipstick with the aid of her phone camera and opined that it was all, well, a lot. Not that I'm famous at all, Maria added, but within my niche, an obscene number of people know exactly who I am. It's interesting you chose the piano, Archie said. Did you not think about trying the tiny violin? I'm not responsible for how people treat me, Maria said. That's one of the first things my therapist mentioned. Is she any good? Archie said. So invalidate me all you want, Maria continued. I can't choose how you behave towards me. I can only choose how I respond. This valid, invalid stuff, Archie said. It's drivel. Contracts are valid passports, train tickets. He warmed to his theme. Driver's licences, doctor's notes, Pythagoras' theorem, the law of supply and demand. Luke interjected. This sounds like the most depressing possible version of we didn't start the fire. But all these things are valid, Archie said. It's objective. People aren't. Economics is objective, Luke said. If you take the premises as true, Archie said. Astrology is valid if you take the premises as true. Spoken like a Virgo, Maria said. Phoebe was only half following the conversation. Celine's friends were all like that, full of screams and laughter and wild gesticulation when it came to theoretical disputes, but with zero ability to talk about anything right in front of them, about each other, about the breath they shared. By sunrise, it was only Phoebe and Archie. Maria had gone home and Luke had booked a room in the hotel. He seemed to have plied Celine with some bullshit or other about taking an emergency flight back to Dublin. No way could a man so useless pull that one off. But maybe he would. Phoebe and Archie stayed up dancing, then strolled southwards to the top of Regent's Canal at Little Venice. It's nice walking when everyone's asleep, Phoebe told Archie. Quite. But it does get scary when you're alone. 
She enjoyed the river's patterns of movement. The wet rings on the surface expanded evenly. But then came an interruption. A duck swam by or a leaf fell in. And there was chaos for a time. And back to order. Probably if she were Celine, she'd take all this to represent her life somehow or to be making a broader point. But couldn't water just be water? Phoebe hoped it could. Eventually she said, Do you think I could be happy? You've got to try, Archie said. One Saturday in mid-December, six months after Luke and Celine's engagement party, Archie awoke with a pain and a complication. Pain, headache, complication, stranger beside him. The freckled man stirred. Archie's East London warehouse conversion studio was his castle, and here was an invader. Morning, Archie said. How's your head? I'm dying, the man said. I've got painkillers. I don't want to steal. Don't be silly. You're my guest. Then the performative reach into the bedside drawer followed by, Christ, I'm out. Sometimes that alone got rid of them, but the freckled man said nothing. Archie continued, I'll go and buy you some. It's not that bad, the freckled man said. You just told me you were on the brink of death. It's really no trouble. I can't send you off into the cold. Don't be silly, Archie said. Tell you the truth. My own head's a fright. He pulled on his things. Cotton boxers, merino wool socks, linen shirt, jeans, coat with scarf draped around lapel so he didn't have to separately remember scarf, waved the freckle man goodbye and slammed the door. The winter wind stung his face. Did he have the man's number? Yes, he'd saved it last night under freckles to avoid admitting he'd missed the stranger's name. It would have been slicker, no doubt, to let freckles enter his own contact details. But the smooth option was a stealthy beast and only reared its head once he'd already taken the alternative stupid idiot approach. Five minutes down the street, Archie texted the freckled man. Sorry. I'm an idiot. Just remembered I've got tennis. Have to run. I'll buy gear at the court. Ha ha. I didn't bring any. Take your time though. The door locks itself. Hopefully see you soon. In their Oxford days, Luke had witnessed one too many of Archie's morning after alibis. Eventually, he'd snapped. They were at breakfast in Magdalene's wood-panelled Tudor dining hall, where they sat across from one another at the bottom of a long bench. You know, it's not any kinder, Luke said to Archie, leading people on when you could just say you're not interested. The boy did harangue. Archie responded with a mouthful of cornflakes. I'll take you up on three points, swallowed the cornflakes. First, I never said it was kinder to them. It's kinder to me, because it spares me an unpleasant conversation, which brings me to my other point. You said three. I'll find a third. Second objection is that people say they hate being strung along, but they don't really. They hate rejection. Archie took another mouthful of cereal. They wouldn't take any more kindly to an explicit no. Actually... I'd wager the same rejection hurts less when it's implicit than when you're told in as many English words that someone doesn't want you. Pass the orange juice, Luke said. This was in their second year, a few months after they'd broken up. That's what it was, a breakup, though Archie avoided using the term breakup aloud. Nor had he called Luke his boyfriend in the first place. At boarding school, age 17, Archie had avidly consumed dating manuals that told straight women how to determine whether men were into them. Apparently, when a real man wanted something, he went out and bloody well got it. So your guy wasn't with you? Then tough luck, 
doll face, he didn't want to be. Then Archie had reached for non-fiction specifically addressing the man not sure a fellow man is into him scenario. All he found was stuff about how to have sex, which seemed to Archie a simple matter of communication, spatial reasoning and rudimentary hygiene. So Archie stopped wondering if guys were into him and asked himself only if he was into them. For as long as he was, he stuck around. This policy still suited Archie when he met Luke in their first week at university. But as they kept seeing one another, Archie became insecure. Over the first two term breaks, he went to San Francisco with three school friends, then to Delhi with his mum. On neither occasion did Luke give Archie so much as an, I'll miss you. Then Luke told Archie that he'd be in Ireland over the summer holidays. They were in Archie's room. Their first year at Oxford was nearly over and the days were warm and bright. The evening sun shone through the blinds and made golden rectangles on the desk. What are you in Ireland for? Archie replied. Luke stood opposite the bed. The corkboard behind him held Archie's over-ambitious to-do lists, Polaroids of friends and fashion cutouts from Vogue. Meeting family, Luke said. Where in Ireland are they? You're saying Ireland a lot. I love Ireland. My dad sides Irish. You've mentioned, Luke said. It's in Dublin my family are. It's quite an Irish syntax. The old country never leaves you. Luke, you were born in Croydon. Details. Are you nervous meeting your dad? I won't be seeing him, Luke said. He's in London now. Archie knew not to probe further. His childhood had taught him the main skill required for an upper-middle-class British man, how to tiptoe around others without seeming an outright runt. He was the youngest of four boys and had grown up in a drafty country home where his brothers knocked him about. His mum, Anjali, kept order as best she could, but she commuted to her cyber security firm in London, and whenever she was gone, it was Lord of the Flies. Archie had learned to avoid clobberings through the rotating petty pugilism that constituted family banter. You started a million arguments. None of them went anywhere. And as long as you sided with one chap one minute and another the next, all was well. It was different with Luke, whose brain seemed not to reward him for starting fights. Archie had liked this conflict aversion right up until that evening when Luke said he'd be in Ireland all summer. Good of you to let me know, Archie said. Yeah, just, that's the plan, Luke said. When did you know you'd be in Ireland? Last week? Maybe a bit before? You couldn't get anything out of him. Archie stood up and walked the short length from the bed to the window, then back. I would have factored you in if I'd done that sort of thing. What sort of thing? Go to Ireland? But it's subjective. Archie paced around faster now, and he was babbling. Or perhaps he would have babbled anyway and his limbs were just keeping up. Matter of preference, do you consult people, don't you, sort of thing. Luke stood still by the cork board, which combined with Archie's pacing gave the impression that it was Luke's room and not Archie's. What do you mean? Archie took a sharp inhale. Why didn't you ask me about going to Ireland? What was that to ask? I don't want you to fuck off for months at a time without checking if I mind. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Luke said. Confirmed. Truly impossible to make Luke fight. Archie said, Sorry and you'll change, or sorry and you won't. Sorry, I won't, Luke said. I mean, I probably won't. I'm not good with relationships. But that's not a mysterious... You're talking about your own actions like it's a weather forecast. You're you. You're management. You decide if you'll be good with relationships or not. Archie. This is impossible. I'll still be your friend when I've stopped being pissed off at you. But I'm not having sex with you anymore. That worked for Luke. Everything worked for Luke. In bed, Archie could do anything he wanted. 
Strolling around Oxford's lanes, Archie could lead the way. And when they looked at menus, Archie could pick. In Luke's eyes, everyone else reached decisions easily and they were perpetually bothering Luke for his casting vote. Archie decided that summer to remove his heart from the basket of items Luke would never make his mind up about. It had sounded like a pathetic excuse. Not good at relationships. But eventually Archie understood. It wasn't that option A was unappealing or option B was unappealing. It was the very act of choosing that Luke couldn't stand. And if he ever accidentally made a choice, he'd promptly do something else to unchoose it. When they reunited at Oxford to start their second year, Archie began his post-Luke pattern of seeing men for a little while and then dropping them. Luke seemed to find this hypocritical. But their core mentalities were different. Luke hated decisions and so never committed to an option, but also never foreclosed on it, not if he could help it. Archie decided quickly, no to this boy and no to that boy and no to the next boy. He just didn't tell them because surely they'd take the hint. Throughout the rest of their university days and for a few years afterwards and come to think of it well into the moth-eaten vestiges of Archie's twenties and actually probably across the remaining span of Archie's life it was still a yes to Luke if Luke would only say it back or so Archie claimed. Another part of him suspected that he liked Luke specifically because Luke was unavailable. This allowed Archie to be equally commitment-phobic while pitying himself as the wounded beseecher. What would actually happen if Luke turned around and said, Archie, I need you? Maybe Archie would reply, Very kind of you, sir, but I'm dashed fond of my freedom, so I'll be off. He'd never know, so he remained obsessed. On and on it went after graduation, throughout their five subsequent years as London housemates. Sober, in broad daylight, Archie preserved what dignity he could. But with enough drink and surrounding buzz, Archie inevitably kissed Luke and asked if Luke was still, you know, not really down for a relationship. Luke didn't say yes and didn't say no and kept on being Luke. Then Luke moved to Dublin three and a half years ago and Archie began renting his East London loft studio with its exposed brick walls and cast iron beams. A few months after Luke's Irish relocation, Archie met Celine. He flew to Dublin at the weekend and joined Luke and his new girlfriend for coffee. Celine was short, plain-faced, dressed in taupe, the soul of inoffense. She wore black leather gloves And when she touched Luke's face, she seemed to steer him. The three exchanged hugs. Archie knew. Selene must have known, too. She didn't have any more of Luke's love. She was just better at forcing decisions. Now six months remained until the wedding. Archie had only lied to his freckled bedmate about the painkillers. He really did have tennis that Saturday and would have to arrive early to buy gear. The court was in his law firm, a 20-minute tube ride away. A few hours afterwards, he'd be meeting Luke. The cocaine in his coat pocket would swing him through doubles, but he'd need to top a blader, or he'd collapse. And then, before last night's yes became entrenched, he'd have to tell Luke he couldn't be best man at the wedding. A real no. Not a Luke, no. Tell me you won't have the stag here, Luke said. Cross my heart, Archie said. And I'd say, and hope to die, but I just played tennis, so I hope to die regardless. They sat on a leather couch in the basement of Archie's Gentleman's Club. A Christmas tree stood under the central chandelier. Luke found the place ridiculous, but he had tired of lampooning Archie for being a member, so at least the lectures had stopped. Archie knew very well, thank you, that private clubs were elitist. 
all the same. He needed somewhere to go. The moment anyone offered him a serviceable alternative, he would gladly take a scissors to his membership card. Until then, he refused to camp out in a workspace cafe like some biohacked freelance life coach. You're also welcome not to do a stag, Luke continued. As long as everyone blames you. That's actually my preferred option. In the six months since the engagement party, Luke had acquired a new haircut and a faint layer of stubble. Does Celine know you're here? Archie said. Why wouldn't she? Since that peculiar night, Luke had been in London every few weeks for work. This wasn't unusual. His tech firm had always flown him around. Still, on each visit, Archie had asked Luke if Celine knew he was there. Luke hated the question, but, as ever, was immovable towards overt strife. Archie probed deeper each time. You could do worse than join a club, Archie said. If you're in London and you don't want Celine knowing, kip out in the rooms, work downstairs, home meetings even. Total discretion. What happens in Mayfair and so on and all the rest of it. Celine knows I'm in London. Above the cherub-carved mantelpiece was a clock that read 8pm. Archie leaned on the arm of the couch. Luke, I've been thinking. I'm sorry to hear that, Luke said. Get well soon. I've been thinking about the wedding. I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't be best man. Luke's tone was relaxed. What's on your mind? Well, Archie said. Skeptics might point out that I'm the only person besides Celine you've had a significant... I've had other relationships. Vivian, that was three dates. I'm still not sure what your problem is, Luke said. If you're going to be like this, why come to the wedding at all? You're right. I shouldn't. The club's other members drank coffee, played chess, laughed. The Christmas spirit had visited them early. That, or their bonuses were in. Archie, Luke looked straight ahead. I need you there. Celine should be enough for you. This isn't about Celine. If she's not enough, then don't marry her. Rather coldly, Luke said, thanks for the advice. I'm not trying to interfere, Archie said. Then don't. But I can't watch you marry Celine. Why? You know why, Archie said, and left. Archie had texted the Kaiser and reached his apartment block just before nine. It was freezing as he left the cab. The Kaiser was either Belgian or Polish. Nobody was sure, so they gave him a nickname that was only one border off either way. The bell of number 38 was broken, so Archie knocked, and the Kaiser opened the door. He was two metres tall, which made his pokey residence a particularly comical choice. It was the equivalent of a normal person choosing to live in a hat. Behind the Kaiser was a woebegone Christmas tree that looked as if it had been there since last year. I'm not in a yuletide mood, Archie said. We'll put you in one, his host replied. It sounded like a threat. By the ghastly couch to the left of the room, one woman sat on another's lap. The undermost said, what time is it? Archie checked his phone. Nine o'clock. The bathroom door opened. It was Phoebe. Phoebe stretched her legs over Archie's lap. Archie hadn't seen her since the engagement party six months ago. How do you know the Kaiser? He comes to Jimmy Coughlin's. They'd claimed the right half of the couch. The woman-woman compound to their left was quite undisturbed by them. The Kaiser had absconded and had told Archie to man the ship until he returned. Were people never done putting Archie in charge of things? Would you like some modafinil? I'm on the straight and narrow. Phoebe outlined her joints, dimensions with her finger. If you got that from the Kaiser, I'd say it has about as much marijuana as chicken nuggets have chicken. Archie sipped his beer and added, thinking aloud, stupid argument earlier. Probably. 
Who with? Archie wasn't listening to Phoebe. Something had turned in him, and he was talking and talking. I should tell him how I feel, he said. It might ruin things between us, but at least I'll move on. Let me disclose something, Phoebe. Let me inveigh. This is important. If you need to be chosen, you'll keep going after people who'll never choose. He puts his beer down. Not the most expedient course of action, but that's what I do. I pick a person who hates deciding and I beg him, decide on me. Maybe it's that I hate choosing too. Maybe I don't want to be chosen after all. And if he ever did choose me, I'd leave. Mind yourself, Phoebe said and closed her eyes. Then Luke texted. They'd come far, but they always wound up in small rooms. First, Archie and Luke had met in their owlish little studies at Oxford. They hadn't cared that their personal fiefdoms were tiny because they slept in a tower and were part of something grand. After their degrees, they shared a South London Victorian terrace with Vivian and Sean. Archie began training as a lawyer. Luke started his graduate scheme in tech and they only saw one another on weekends. Archie's London life comprised a few key elements. Sugar daddies within legal profession who flattered themselves he wanted mentorship. Sad boys of Luke archetype who always texted back, which should have meant Luke without the bad bits, but actually meant Luke minus the intermittent reward structure that thrills the fickle brain. Sad boys of Luke archetype who were as sporadically distant as Luke, making them useless to Archie because better the devil you know. Number of times went AWOL from flat for several days, usually to stay at a sugar daddy's apartment, and told himself that nobody cared, but it secretly meant a lot to him that they all kept calling and texting. Five. Times kissed Luke while drunk? Three. Times kissed Luke while sober? One. It wasn't quite stable, but things had a rhythm. Then Luke moved to Dublin for good. He'd been floating the prospect ever since the first visit to Ireland when they were students. He'd never thought Luke would actually go through with it. Still, Luke was allowed to leave. He'd found someone to take over his room and handle the transition responsibly. Luke had never promised Archie he'd stay in London. And nothing in their relationship said that Luke had to factor Archie into his decisions. Indeed, nothing in their relationship said that they had a relationship. Which was bollocks when he thought about it. What else would you call it when two individuals related? I relate to you, you relate to me, but we don't relate? Claptrap. Even by saying the words, this isn't a relationship, you've just created one. You've jolly well instituted a state of affairs. Balderdash. Hate it. But it wasn't a relationship. He nonetheless managed to act chipper right up until Luke's going away party. That night... Archie mixed gin with vodka and spoke his mind. I still don't see why Dublin, he told Luke. Dublin because, I don't know, Luke himself was fairly plastered. My mother's from there, so really I am too. You always say mother, Archie said. You can't say mum because mum is English. But you know you'd sound ridiculous saying anything else with your accent. Want to know what else you sound ridiculous saying? That you're from Dublin. You're from where I'm from. And I've got just as much right as you to decide I'm Irish. You think I'm joking, but I'm serious. You're Irish to them if you stay in England and you achieve things here. Then they'll be the first to credit your Irish grandparents or your Irish parents or the trace of Irish sediment in your piss. But to go to Ireland and claim you're Irish, forget it. I don't care, Luke said. I want to be in Dublin and I don't need your input. There it was. Archie needed Luke and Luke didn't need Archie. The following morning they behaved as if the conversation had never happened. Luke packed in his room with the door open. Archie said hello from the hall. 
and they talked about how close Dublin really was when you thought about it. At noon, the four housemates gathered in the kitchen. Archie's hug lasted as long as everyone else's and they all said their goodbyes and Luke was gone. But they always came back to small rooms and the space seemed enough for them. College, terraced house, hotel. Last night, as he approached the hotel, Archie had planned his speech. He'd come shivering into the lobby, wiped the snow off his feet and ran over the sentences in his head. This needs to end. Please understand. We can't even be friends because it stops me from accepting that we'll never be anything more. Loneliness wasn't having no one. Loneliness was the gap between what you hoped for and what you got. Archie had climbed six flights of stairs up to Luke's room because it would have been torture standing still in the lift. The sentences kept coming. You don't love me, so let me find someone who does. Don't ask Celine to marry you. Freak out. Cheat, then get married anyway. Don't invite me to your engagement party. Don't ask me to be your best man. I need a clean break. I shouldn't be the one ending this. If you care about me, let me go. All well and good until Luke opened the door. Intentions shipshape. But the room was as small as their previous ones. Laid out to jog memories. Their old circuits fired anew. Now London awoke and traffic moved. Soon Luke would catch his midday flight. There was nothing to do on a day like this but make coffee. Archie pulled on Luke's terry cotton robe and hobbled past the bed to the machine. Luke smiled faintly. Archie said, What? Nothing. You. I like looking at you. Of all the hellish things for Luke to say, Archie had a specific and developed and presently very painful fantasy of waking up every morning to make their coffee. Dreams had no business coming true. Say what you will, Archie said, but I wear a good bathrobe. You mean you're a good thief? Archie carried over the coffee tray and sat on the edge of the bed. I can't be your best man now. Can we agree on that? Yeah, Luke said. That one I might have to concede. Keep this speech short. I've got 12 hours to write it. It's late June, 11.18pm. Technically, it's 42 minutes until my wedding day. I, Luke, am alone in a hotel room near the church. Celine is at her Aunt Maggie and Uncle Grellin's house. She's probably asleep in the guest room, white dress laid on the ottoman at her feet. We'd booked my room for us both to stay in, but Celine's aunt intervened. Apparently we can't see each other for a full day before the vows. I'm not convinced Maggie realises Celine's had sex. Anyway, I won't see Celine until 2pm tomorrow. If I show up at the church. But maybe I won't. Maybe I'll elope with Archie. A little past midnight now and still no groom speech. 14 hours until the wedding. Honestly, I have no idea how Celine has put up with me for so long. But here's my theory. The first time Celine asked me up to her Dublin apartment, she made tea. The moon shone through the lace curtained window. The kettle hummed. Her flatmates had assigned her the highest cabinet shelf, which she could only access by ladder. And Paddy's tall, she said as she unfolded the steps. So why can't he just... I was workshopping a non-dickish way to say... I'm also tall, so why don't I just... But she was already on the ladder, reaching. Her dress was soft white cotton. I traced the embroidered cutouts along her torso. She kissed the top of my head, giggled again at her unwanted vantage point. Her foot shuffled on the step, but she kept her balance. I knew all I needed to know then. 
Celine and I both love details, but in different ways. Her love of detail is sated through piano. She squints at scores, strokes keys, but really her physical interactions with the broader world. Abstraction saves time, is efficient, lets her get back to making music. Ask Celine to describe me, she'll give you the vaguest adjectives. Handsome, or whatever. She can't tell you that I slouch, or that I bring a brown satchel to work, that I like my toast slightly burnt. Once Celine likes the idea of something, it can reek and pinch and clang and she'll barely notice. If you've sold her on a concept, you've sold the lot. Whereas I look for tangibility. I can hate the idea of my relationship with Celine, but if I like to feel her skin through her dress's embroidered slits while lemon tea brews in her Mozart mug, then I'll stay. In those early days, I was the boss. This truly wasn't apparent to me at the time. My assumption was I'd fuck it up, so I thought I'd say up front, I'll fuck it up. Except I didn't put it that way. I said, I don't want anything serious. Knowing Celine as I do now, I realised my phraseology must have kicked her into change Luke's mind mode. So did the rest of my behaviour. She was more fascinated by my red four days ago than she could ever have been by a response. The void was her kink. Try explaining people. Anyway, she was jittery in those first few weeks. Then she laid down her ultimatum. High ceiling brunch place in the Liberties. We ordered two Americanos. When the waiter left, Celine sat up straight. If you want to date, we can date, she told me. If you don't, we stop. I'd only just moved to Dublin. I missed Archie. Honestly, I shouldn't have been dating, and I definitely wasn't ready for a relationship, but I was gone on her since that very first house party. It was up or out, and out I couldn't take. So maybe you're beginning to see why it took me so long to understand that Celine saw me as the boss. Three events made it clear. One, she agreed for Archie to be my best man, back before that whole thing imploded. There's no way she wanted Archie on our wedding photos. She just didn't want to say no. Two, she let me off the hook about bailing from the engagement party. Three, I lied that night about already being back in Dublin. I rang her from a hotel and just before I hung up, a nearby door slammed. She must have decided not to hear. That, and she probably saw me at the airport the following morning. I'm not certain of this, she didn't quite meet my eye, but her head jerked, rapid. How you turn when you've just been caught staring. She never said a word to me about that morning. A year later, she still hasn't. What did I tell you? Sell her on a concept, and she'll ignore the thing itself. In a vacuum, Celine's behaviour would be insane. She's a gifted pianist and general savant. Why would she strain herself to hold on to some guy? Especially when she didn't make any such compromises for her ex-girlfriend, a fellow virtuoso. Answer? Heteronormativity is a near-ubiquitous form of mania. You've heard the phrase, he's just not that into you. If asked, why don't men commit? You'll say, they will, just not to you. If asked, why don't women commit? You'll say, commit what? Suicide? I mean, I know maybe it's jarring that I complain about patriarchy when supposedly it benefits me. But you know The Crown, the Netflix series about the British royal family? Not a single person in that show is happy. It's because the system destroys everyone who sustains it. Even, or especially, those on top. Anyway, that's where I'm at, vis-a-vis -vis Bride. You'd think Celine would see my early diffidence as a warning. Like, whatever about the unanswered texts, me literally saying I don't want a relationship is perhaps a red flag. But Celine has never met sheet music she couldn't crack. She kind of thinks people are the same. And in fairness, I wasn't going anywhere. Didn't want a relationship, no, but absolutely did not want to lose her. String her along, perhaps. Not wedded to net positive life impact, flexible on that point. But I was her recurring happiness destroyer, all hers. And the world's insanities made me worth having. She got me to commit. The recurring happiness destroyer's word and bond. 
a pearl beyond all human wealth. Will she get me to the altar? I don't want her daily practice. I don't want her constant financial uncertainty, refusal to go anywhere for longer than two days if there's no piano, and willingness to drop all plans when some pissant orchestra rings her up saying, please can you learn some Tchaikovsky-ass bullshit in a week? If she were a man, she'd be a prick. The haughty professor. Some woman feels responsible for him or she's depriving the world of his beautiful mind. And he's like, iron my shirt so humankind can know my genius. Tidy my sock drawer so humankind can know my genius. Wait until I've left my study and then kindly clean up after me, but make sure I'm done for the night, because if I rush back to scribble a note and I see you at the desk gathering my plates and mugs, then you'll extinguish my eureka. But if I return in the morning and the plates and mugs are still there, my spark may well also snuff out. Its flame eludes me. I'm not saying it's exactly the same in my case. For one thing, I don't feel morally obliged to nurture a genius just because they're a genius. I don't do Lang Lang's laundry. I also wouldn't do lists. Incidentally, it pisses me off when Celine compares herself to Liszt. Her thing is like, Liszt lived his best life and had loads of pupils and still played for hours a day, so why can't I? Answer, other people's labour. That's how Celine can be a full-time pianist. Someone picks her food and someone else sells it, or stands there while she operates the self-service checkout without removing her gloves. I don't know how to estimate, but let's say for argument's sake, 10 specific people? 20? Living conditions ranging from breadline to slavery so that Celine can play the piano. Not so that. As in, nobody signed up. There's no form that says, please write your name if you would like to harvest wheat in service of Western art. But that's the economy in which music is made. This can be true, and it can also be true, that Celine's got fewer servants than Liszt. She'll have one less within a few hours. Maybe. Am I sure I love her? Unfortunately, yes. It's 1.22am now. Wedding's in less than 12 hours. It's still just possible I'll marry her. Celine, thank you for everything. Celine, I'd like to... Celine. Celine. I realised I'd loved you when we'd been together a year. We were in bed. So, you know how I said it was good and you started breaking down what you'd done? I said. It made me realise you always do that. Piano, sex, doesn't matter. Whatever you've just been praised for, your automatic response is to explain how you did it. I told you that, and you said, Sorry, oh my god, I'll stop. Don't stop, I said. It's you. I knew I loved you then. Or thought I knew. But do I really love hearing you think? After all, I don't like hearing you practice. Isn't that the same thing, really? thinking through a piece. I mean, if we had a bigger apartment, but five hours a day in a tiny room. Hardly ever a whole score from start to end. Sometimes the same few bars for an hour. The same few notes, even. Sight reading, drills. Piano uses more of your brain than just about anything else can. It's the hardest your mind works. So if I don't want to listen, then, yeah. Anyway, that day three years ago, I decided I loved you. Two weeks beforehand, I was already fairly sure. We stood at the tram stop. It was a spring morning in Dublin and the cobblestones glistened with rain. The billboards opposite us were papered with peeling adverts for an Abbey play. A busker nearby played guitar, badly, but with rhythm so you couldn't help tapping your foot. His case was open, and on top of the purple lining lay three gold coins, shiny like the cobblestones. And then I was back thinking about those. And you looked at some guy's leather shoes and said, The cracks on shoes are kind of like the backs of hands. I knew then we had the talking thing. You'll say something about a man's leather shoes. 
the cracks on shoes are kind of like the backs of hands and that there's symmetry, you know, hands and feet. Or if not that, you'll notice something else. And, and I'll think of stuff as well. I'll say there's also a symmetry between the round shiny coins and the round shiny cobblestones. Or I won't say that because I'm not a complete end. but anyway. Main thing is, I can make completely pointless remarks to you and you can make them to me. Because it's not pointless. You saying it is the point. 2.14am. Wedding's in 11 hours, 46 minutes. Got too tired to sit at the desk, so I'm slumped on the bed now. The duvet remains tucked. If I get under it, I'll fall asleep and I'll wake up with no groom speech and then I'll definitely bail. Which would help, in a way. It'd make the decision easier. The problem is, I love her. How can I love her and be such a prick? We need to go further back. I met Archie at university. I was just trying to get through my first day. The Magdalene Junior common room was having a freshers quiz, and I'm better at talking to people within structured formats. I waited at the common room threshold and only entered once things were about to start. The girl at the sign-up desk handed me a label and a marker and said, write your name and course. I wrote, Luke Donnelly, philosophy and theology, lots of E sounds, and scanned for a team to join. Now here's a candidate, someone said. Deep brown eyes, sharp cheekbones, black hair. Then I couldn't keep looking directly into the sun and instead peered at the mustard jumper and a tag. Archit Patel Stopford. Law. If you're Scottish, I'll kill you, the boy said. Something funny to say back? Nothing came. Finally, I said, I'm not Scottish. Therefore Donnelly's Irish, the boy said. Yes? Second gen, I said. Both parents from Dublin. Spiffing, the boy said. Luke, I'm Archie. You don't have a team, do you? Ditch them if so. They may say I'm a dreamer, but it turns out, Monsieur Donnelly, I'm not the only one, having finally found a person the fourth of Irish heritage. I wasn't yet used to Archie's facetious archaisms and wondered who actually said spiffing. Archie led me to a table with the team name scrawled on a placard, Isle Ampersand. Two others were already seated, and Archie gestured as he introduced them. Sean, of New York extraction, several ancestors having fled the Great Irish Famine from County Mayo. Vivian, Lagos born, moved to Ireland as a child, then to London age 15. He then pointed at himself. Archit to Hindophones, Archie to Anglos, Archibald to racist cab drivers, one Irish grandparent, one English, two Indian, equals third gen something or other. Turning finally to me, Angels? Our fourth. He's definitely more Irish than me or Sean. Vivian's the most Irish, having actually lived there, but you could arm wrestle if keen to resolve. We're not keen, Vivian said. Luke, sit down before the siege it scares you off. We went out in our first year. Then, just before the summer, he confronted me about making plans to visit Dublin without his permission. I'm not good with relationships, I improvised. Anyway, Archie ended it then. A moronic part of me had been hoping he'd beg and plead and say, No, Luke, I need you. But that's not what people actually do when they want a relationship and you don't. In real life, if they like themselves, they say, Well, bye then. And if they hate themselves, they think, I better go along with this. And they say, That's cool. Let's just see how it goes. So, of the two options, I do think Archie took the better one. Draw your own conclusions about Celine. Next came Vivian. We dated for a few weeks in our final year at Oxford. She dumped me so conclusively that I got over her fairly soon. After our finals, Vivian and I moved down to London with Sean and Archie. The first year in our shared house was the happiest of my life. I helped Vivian practice for interviews until she got her first art gallery job. 
At exhibition openings, she developed a secret eyebrow raise for when she wanted me to save her from creeps. We play-acted a different relationship each night. These ersatz partnerships were far more fun than the real one we'd attempted. It's what Celine later articulated to me as the harmony melody thing, melody being the highlights. Vivian and I did nothing but melody on those nights. Me in a dress down work suit, her in a cocktail dress. We nibbled olives and nodded at portraits. The harmony, the everyday stuff, would still suck if we tried, so we didn't. Then Archie's substance abuse got worse and his demands on me grew. He spent his rent money on cocaine and asked me to spot him. Went missing, came back and snapped when I'd asked where he'd been. It was too much for me. That and I was restless. My tech firm offered a move to Dublin and I went. Then came Celine. Dated, moved into number 23 after two years, adopted Madame Esmeralda after 2.5 and got engaged within three. Now, today, after four years together, we're getting married. 4.33 a.m. Headache. Need more coffee. Or maybe less. Too late for less, so let's try more. About the affairs. I slept with Gronya, Celine's conservatoire chum, before Celine and I went exclusive. I didn't like Gronya, and she seemed like a bad friend to Celine, and, I mean, was I wrong? But I could sense the talk approaching with Celine. You know, do we make this serious or do we stop? Anyway, the Gronya thing wound up forcing the let's date properly talk. And I told Celine, yes, 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 yes. Don't want a relationship, but can't stand to lose you, so yes. I didn't say all those words, but yeah. Two weeks later, Gronya again. And what's her face the following month? Tanya? Who said afterwards, fingers crossed she dumps you soon. Deeply unclear if that's a compliment. When I finally fucked Archie six months ago, after a decade of our being mostly platonic, we woke up in a hotel room not unlike the one I'm in now. And we made coffee. Coffee is a ritual I've never managed to establish with Celine. There I was, half a year after my engagement party and another six months before the ceremony, drinking coffee with Archie. The comparison isn't fair. When I lived with Archie, I needed to ask him not to do coke in the sitting room, never mind show up for coffee hour. I haven't cheated since that night with Archie. Stand up citizen, I know. Luke for president. But you must be wondering what happened at the engagement party. At 8pm, the hour we told guests to arrive at the Birches, I overheard Celine saying she couldn't find her camera. Since we hadn't invited anyone who'd been raised by wolves, this gave me plenty of time to look for it before a single person actually showed up. Upstairs, I started my search with the usual question. Where would I forget to look if I were Celine? The birches filled with gabbing relatives, all in awe of Celine. I heard them congregate, even identified my own friends, Vivian, Archie, Sean, and couldn't move. If you're wondering why I surround myself with such brassy people, it's because I'm a coward on my own. I haven't become any more socially confident since my teens. I've just learned to always have a Celine or an Archie or a Vivian, or even a Sean. But there I was, trapped, too nervous to emerge alone, even though they were all literally downstairs. I adore my brain, truly. Anyway, someone rapped on the door. Without waiting for a response, in walked Celine's ex, Maria. An hour later, we were in a hotel lobby. Maria talked. The speed of her articulation had smeared lipstick on her teeth, but you'd need a man braver than me to tell her. Back in Celine's uncle's guest room, Maria had offered me two choices. I could sneak away with her and answer her questions, or she could yell downstairs that she'd found me. The first option had seemed more attractive in the guest room, since it enriched my present self at the cost of future me. Now, future me was current me, and I wasn't loving life. First question, Maria said. Why are you hiding from your own engagement party? I claimed the armchair beside Maria and held out a drink. Your second question, I said. You still have to answer the first. Very well. 
I left the party because I wanted to talk to you. The truth, please, Maria said. More than I wanted to talk to Celine's second cousins. Keep going. There's also a grand aunt, I said. You're threatened by Celine, Maria said. You got nervous at having hundreds of people assess whether you're a good enough trophy husband. Celine's many things, but I wouldn't have said rich enough to buy an entire person. That kind of trophy spouse doesn't confer status at all. Not anymore. It's crass to marry someone whose sole talent is being hot. More's the pity if you ask me, because the hot spark joy wherever they go and ought to be nurtured like plants. But what's still acceptable is choosing someone with forms of cultural capital you lack. It can easily be mutual. Celine's also a trophy for you. Okay, I said, meaning I'd had enough of the topic. Without you, Maria continued, Celine would seem like an out-and-out -out head case. Made-up job, zero social life, but with a nice stable husband, she's merely eccentric. I see. And Celine gives you culture. Without her, your life appears barren. Fine. To me, at least. I gathered. Now, Maria said, my second question, why is Celine with you? Haven't you just answered that, to your own satisfaction at least? No, Maria said. I was talking social utility. Want to hear my theory? No, but I have the wildest hunch that I'm about to. Celine likes men who are effeminately handsome, e.g. you, Maria said, and women who are mannishly beautiful, e.g. your correspondent. It's the same with personality. She likes bossy women and men who do what they're told. Interesting. How often do you make her come? What? I've shocked you, she said with sleek relish. Here's my guess. 40% of the time. The other 60? you delegate to her green Japanese vibrator. I spilled my drink. Maria added, Guess how I knew. Then Phoebe and Archie walked in. 8am. Six hours until the wedding. I've worked out why Celine's uncle Grelin is so weird about me and coffee. Grelin notices someone doing a them thing, and he loves people, and it's funny to him. That's what Irish dads do. They assign everyone a thing, and then they keep asking the person if they still do that thing. If you're meeting a middle-aged Irish man and you wish to determine the content of his Irish dad joke, you could wear a yellow hat. Then, every time you see him, he'll go, Anna, what happened to that yellow hat there now? They're showing they remembered your thing. And they choose their things randomly, don't get me wrong. There's zero overlap between what you think is your thing and what an Irish dad deems your thing but they're saying you matter. I look at Grelin and on some level I think, if I were to decide the meaning of life is happiness, and if I stopped trying to be better than people, and if I tried to love them instead, it would be an investment. I'd get to be Grelin by Grelin's age. I once saw myself doing that with Celine. But Celine doesn't love me just for existing. Celine loves that I listen to her thoughts, do household things, sometimes make her come and otherwise happily delegate the task to her green Japanese vibrator. Or was happy to, until I learned who gave her it. A robot could do all that. More efficiently, read the vibrator. Whereas Grelin... And not just Grelin. Archie. Archie and Grelin are two men whom I love just for existing. I've had enough presence in Archie's life that we've ended up doing stuff for each other. But that's not the point. And Grelin has done nothing for me except bring up what are by now the world's most discussed coffee beans. Nonetheless, Grelin, weirdly, is the kind of man I want to be. I used to think I'd get there with Celine. Used to. Then I cheated and lied, and we got engaged, and I cheated and lied some more. Now I can barely look at her. That's not Celine's fault, obviously but the relationship is making me worse. Worse than what? I'm not sure. But baseline Luke can't be this bad. Inconveniently though, I still love her. I'm the man I was four years ago when she stood on that stepladder. I still want her to hand me the Mozart mug. I want to feed the cat in our hideous green and yellow kitchenette and to say pointless things at each tram stop. Christ, I hate this. I still can't decide. But there's someone I can ask.
Here's my understanding, Vivian said. Yeah? Luke looked like he hadn't slept in 40 years, including 11 that he hadn't been alive for. Vivian picked up three raspberries from the plastic punnet, chewed them and wiped the juice from her mouth. She told Luke she'd expected to be fed and that she hated hotel food. Accordingly, he'd stepped out to Sainsbury's local. The bed served as their table. Cocktail sausages, vegetable samosas, sushi, fruit, a one litre green smoothie carton, all laid out in a towel. A funny sort of breakfast, but those were the best. Do you want the last samosa? Vivian said. Go ahead. She took it and bit off a corner. Crispy. All right, she said. You don't like the idea of marriage, or certainly not the kind you'll have with Celine, where all your needs and goals are sacrificed for her career. But day to day, you love the tiny intimacies. Yeah. Whereas Celine loves the idea of your relationship, but she probably doesn't enjoy the actual experience. Honestly, true. So, Vivian said, you are in mutual unrequited love. I didn't think that was possible, but lucky us. Also, you've cheated on her multiple times and her ex dragged you away from the engagement party and then you lied to Celine about where you'd gone. Celine almost certainly saw you at the airport the next day and she didn't say anything. So then you realised you're both unhappy, even if Celine won't admit it. Correct. Vivian finished her samosa. What now? Something to drink? Vivian walked over to the kettle. At least let's both have another coffee, because a point of sharing food, Luke, is to bond over joint experience. While she spoke, she poured two sachets of instant into the mugs. Now, Vivian said once Luke had sipped his coffee, what are you going to do? Luke put down his mug. I'll marry her. The June sun was warm. It was 9am. An hour ago, after seeing Luke's text, Vivian had cycled over. She'd been visiting her parents. Their house was a two-up, two-down ex-council terrace, helmed by her father Samuel's shrubs. Back in Lagos, Samuel had been a keen home gardener. There'd been nowhere to grow things when the family first moved to Dublin, but he'd planted the garden once they found a London home. Thirteen years later, the landlord had threatened them with yet another rent hike. Samuel recounted the exchange to Vivian while watering his flowers. I fail to understand, he said, why this stack of bricks is worth chicken change. Talk less of £1,800. I asked the landlord, Sir, what's improved about the property of recent? No answer. None expected from madmen. The hydrangeas had just blossomed. They had big pastel petals and a honey vanilla smell. Please could I have one for my coat? Vivian said. I'm off to a wedding. Her father snipped a stem and placed it in her buttonhole. Idiot landlord. His head is not correct. Who's getting married? Luke. Vivian's father didn't know she had dated Luke at university, but he knew Luke as Vivian's ex-housemate. And who's the bride? Samuel said. You don't know her, Vivian said, and thought, nor do I, really. What I worked out about you at Oxford, Vivian told Luke on the hotel bed, is you want to be loved in your entirety. That's not Luke specific. The Luke specific thing is you treat people like shit to see if they'll still love you after. Luke shifted away from her, as if refusing to meet this charge head on. As far as I know, Archie was your first serious relationship, Vivian continued. And Archie thought you should put up with his nonsense, because that's love. Love is letting people hurt you. Archie must have learned it from someone too. We're all taught it, but some of us get over it. And some of us terrorise the general population well into our twenties and beyond. Luke smiled resignedly. You've thought about this. Not really. I'm just smarter than you. He couldn't contest that either. It did bug me though, Vivian added that you could profess to be into me and show it half the time and then the other half you seem to be actively testing my tolerance for pain or my tolerance for dating men, if difference there be. Anyway, I've worked it out. 
and now I'm better at filtering applications. I spot the, yes, I'll be needing my pound of flesh types from 100 miles. I'm glad. Infuriating comment in a vacuum. But she could tell from his mumble that he meant it. Anyhow, she said, that's ancient history. Regarding the wedding, sure, I would diagnose you as a person who needs their pound of flesh and Celine as person who cheerfully denies their flesh loss. I say person when the heterosexual paradigm is pretty transparent on who does what. But in the interest of fairness to my psycho ex-girlfriend, let's stick with person. And it's not that Celine's some masochistic waif who longs to redeem you. She's just stubborn. I mean, yeah. With that being said, Vivian added, you are off your literal rocker to still want to marry her. Luke had been twisting his engagement ring. As Vivian spoke, it slipped and fell on the bedside table. The metal clanged. It was cold and hard and gold. A circle, a line without end. It's too late, Luke said. His voice was steady. I'm not saying she's the only person I could ever feel this way about. If you break down love, it's neural pathways. But those don't get built overnight. It takes a really long time to get addicted to someone. And it's a bitch to break the habit once it's there. He picked up his ring, considered it, placed it on his finger, over the line it had left on his skin. Vivian collected the remains of the Sainsbury's picnic and transferred them to the fridge. But have you considered that she doesn't know you cheated? Dublin's small. She'll find out. And when she does, she'll be pissed. Just something to chew on. But I'm off now. I'll be back in an hour. And if you still want to marry her, all right. Luke didn't look convinced. I know you love her, Vivian added. Probably she loves you too. But you can love someone without that making them a good long-term partner. You and I love each other, right? As friends. Whatever that means. No way in hell are we ever getting married. And it doesn't make the love any less. That's why I hate the one. It belittles our capacity to connect. We all have hundreds of kindred spirits. Thousands, maybe, even millions. We'll never meet most of them. But they're out there. Celine's one of yours. Doesn't mean she should be your wife. I do get that, theoretically. But you don't feel it. Vivian looks at the picture above the hotel bed. Bright colours. Stormy sea. This is corporate art, produced to match the furniture. She's had her art gallery job for nearly eight years now. The working conditions are dreadful and recently drove the staff to strike, but Vivian likes the museum itself. Across her time there, she's had six girlfriends. Each of them found her alluringly mysterious at first. But after a certain point, they wanted to know who died. And they wanted her to need them, miss them. All the things Vivian not only can't express, but can't feel. So they leave. She lets them. She never chases anyone. There'll always be someone else. She looks down from the hotel room painting now and back at Luke. He's getting married today. Unless he's not. Vivian was mildly curious when Luke texted asking her to come over. As he describes his dilemma, she advises. She finds it cathartic to say aloud what she's thought many times. Luke's not cut out for marriage. He probably won't listen. That's all right. She doesn't blame people for being people any more than she'd blame Luke's cat for being a cat. Anyway, it's Luke's life, not hers. Vivian doesn't take it personally when people ignore her two cents. In any case, she's wanted elsewhere. She tells Luke she'll be back. Then she leaves to meet Archie and Sean. Sean was telling Vivian and Archie about the stag he'd organised as Luke's best man. If you want to know what went down, I said, lads on tour, he said. 
although Sean had moved to England from New York 11 years ago. He still said lads as if hoping he hadn't mispronounced it. Go be animals. But Rakesh said, Sean, you're the only animal here. The rest of us are civilised 29-year-olds with insomnia and lower back pain. And Tiernan said, so we... Sean wasn't used to this much airtime. He'd seemed unsure what to do with it. Vivian had her own reasons for keeping quiet. And possibly Archie did too. But it wasn't like Archie to let Sean ramble. And why had Archie missed the stag in the first place? They sat in the back room of a Mayfair restaurant. Vivian and Archie at the banquette and Sean on a Danish looking chair. The interior was a mix of mid-century modern and deco. In the course of Sean's anecdote, their pan au chocolat and mushrooms on sourdough had arrived. Vivian regretted having already filled up on the breakfast that Luke had assembled. Sean was treating them to bottomless, so they accordingly gulped the Prosecco. Vivian, by the way, Archie said, your dress is ravishing. An inelegant change of subject, but she'd go along with it. Vivian held the silk to the light and showed Archie its shimmer. Charity shop. Proper charity shop, Archie said, or Oxfam boutique. There's no flies on this one, Vivian said. What? Sean said. Archie seemed equally perplexed. Must have heard it in Ireland, Vivian said. Such was the nature of growing up in three countries. She usually remembered to sift this or that out of her speech if she thought the other person wouldn't understand. But the Prosecco was doing its job. Sean, Vivian added. Tell us what you did for the stag. We went to Scotland, Sean said. Glasgow, Vivian said. Edinburgh. Sean poured more Prosecco for all of them. The cobbler? It's a hill and we all just climbed it. Tiernan's foot hit a rock and he deadass nearly died. Who's Tiernan? Archie said. Luke's cousin, Sean said. I told you. Right ho, Archie said. Sincerest apologies, I'll remember Tiernan in future. Bra, we'll tattoo name on eyelids. It's not deep. Wrists too. Archie finished his toast and reached for a pastry. One question, though. Shoot, if you don't mind me asking. Dude, what? Who's Tiernan? Vivian laughed. She'd been savouring her Prosecco while the boys skirmished. To her, they were ants. The people at her gallery, too. And before that, her fellow Oxford students. And really all the world. She stood overhead and watched the little black dots, their marching lines, their tripod gait. She could live on their level. She could move among them. But she didn't have to. And often enough, she didn't want to. The persiflage of these particular two ants amused her so greatly that only at 10am did she check her phone. Then she saw Luke's texts. Off to meet my mother. See you at the church. Upstairs in the entrance hall of the Birches, the photographer tested his camera. He was a cousin of Maggie's and had been hired for that reason. Nepotism, darling. C'est la vie. As he adjusted his lens in front of the preening bridesmaids, he wondered if this was quite why he'd gone to art school. Now one of the bridesmaids stomped up the stairs. He switched to continuous shooting. Her real step was clunky and her pout rather smug but he captured a split second where she seemed to be airily ascending, chin high, smooth arm on walnut banister. Phoebe reached the guest room. Should she knock? She did. It's me. Celine had broken a Waterford swan. There were several factors involved. First, her period started. She awoke with cramps and on the toilet she wiped off a clot of blood. Perfect. She deliberately scheduled the wedding to avoid this, but the stress of planning had thrown off her cycle. She put in a tampon and viewed herself in the mirror. Her eyes had looked tired for months. Would the purple shadows fade when they finally said their vows? Since last June's engagement party, Celine had stopped internally playing the piano as she went about her day. 
It was like losing a friend. She'd replaced the habit with headphones, but passive listening didn't offer the same companionship as the 88 keys that had once resided in her brain. She did have Luke. But the lie. Not only his. Hers. The, it's fine, lie. The, I completely didn't see Luke at the airport after he said he was already home, lie. The, I have no misgivings whatsoever about marrying someone who lies, lie. But she loved him. But he'd lied. She returned to the guest room and texted Tanya, her old conservatoire friend and bridesmaid, with the word period and several skull emojis. Tanya helpfully sent back a YouTube compilation entitled The Simpsons, Every Time Homer and Marge Got Married. Celine watched the video in bed. The first clip included casino music at the start of a drive-by ceremony. The second clip featured a few bars from Mendelssohn's Wedding March, transposed to sound Simpson-y. It was 8am now. She could run downstairs to the piano and play the march. In the blue room at the front of the house, Celine lifted the lid. The piano was out of tune, but each note was exactly a semitone lower, so the gaps were the same. The instrument just had a bit of a head cold. After a few rounds of scales, Celine googled the sheet music on her phone and placed it horizontally on the desk above the keys. Celine loved Mendelssohn, and she loved The Simpsons, and she even loved Tanya for sending her that stupid clip, and she was happy to be alive. And if fast meant happy in music notation, then so be it. She'd go faster and faster and faster down the aisle. And the glass swan fell. Off it flew from the piano top and cracked. You did not break the swan, Phoebe told her sister in the guest room. Would you get a grip of yourself? Maggie shouldn't have put it on the piano. Pianos vibrate. Any muppet will tell you that. Besides, it's your wedding. You can break the whole house if you want. In a way, Phoebe was grateful. The broken swan was a specific, immediate thing that had gone wrong. Whereas take, for example, Tanya. She was such a tiny part of the overall picture. She was maybe number 17 among the top 20 reasons Celine shouldn't marry Luke. With any other couple, the groom probably cheated with one of the bridesmaids a few years back would be a calamitous and singular blow. But for this happy couple, on this happy day, it was utterly business as usual. We could do, Phoebe said, head the ball, thingamajig, gold dust. Sorry, Celine said. Phoebe sat in an antique brocade chair and Celine stood by the dresser. The bride already had her gloves on. The swan's shattered glass must have spooked her about hurting her precious hands. You glue back together, Phoebe explained, then do gold along the crack. Kintsugi. Swat. But I'm telling you, Maggie won't notice. Hasn't she a million swanny yokes? Celine held up the broken halves. The neck and beak were clearly a swan's. The other fragment, the back of the wings could have easily passed for a shell. There's something that's... Celine said. Look, Phoebe, just between us, got you, Phoebe said. I don't think Luke was telling the truth, Celine said, about why he went missing at the engagement party. As she spoke, she looked at the floorboards. Phoebe joined her sister by the dresser and fidgeted with the swan, somewhat, slightly just to line up the halves a little better. There. Hardly broken. If I knew something about that night, Phoebe said, something that maybe it'd change your opinion. If I knew something like that, and I could tell you, and I hadn't told you, do you reckon you'd want to know? Celine took the swan again and held it before the window. No, she said. I'd not want to know. She put the swan back and added, you don't always need the full story. It'll be fun, Vivian told Archie. Right, Archie said and downed his espresso. Only it won't. An hour and a half to the wedding. Sean had deserted them for best man duties. 
Vivian and Archie had moved on to a cafe with fish-patterned wallpaper and Persian rugs. Once they'd sat down, Archie told Vivian he'd changed his mind about witnessing Luke's balmy nuptials. They're having it in the Jesuit church, Vivian said. I've nothing against the Jesuits, Archie said. Well, I'm not going on my own. Suit yourself. Let's try again. I'll say, I'm not going on my own, and you say, in that case, Vivian, allow me to escort you. Archie had never properly explained to Vivian why he wasn't Luke's best man anymore. Didn't have the time, he'd said. But in that case, why not just be a groomsman? I'm impressed they managed to book a Catholic church, Archie said. Neither of them believes in it. Vivian laughed. Celine's family seem pretty good at getting things. Remember her uncle's house? But what's the appeal? Luke's by. What's that got to do with it? Archie didn't meet Vivian's eye and attempted to disguise this through looking at nearby areas of her face. Vivian said she was close to pressing a button of some kind. She had no idea what the button might do, which made her all the keener to press it. Finally, Archie said, I don't like people lying to themselves. I hate to break to you, but the church is homophobic. Why marry that? I don't respect it. You don't need to respect Luke, Vivian said. I live beautifully without respecting Luke. Not in terms of his life decisions, anyway. Interesting, too, that Archie had only mentioned Luke, when he must have known Celine was queer as well. Can't you see it's a cop-out? Archie said. It happens to be a woman Luke's marrying. So he gets his Catholic church and the priest nods along and nobody cops that Luke might just as easily have married a man. Luke never has to ask what he'd have done, where he'd have had the ceremony, whether he'd have told his family, I'm not Catholic. None of you are meaningfully Catholic. I don't owe you a Catholic wedding. Vivian put down her coffee mug. That sounds to me like Luke's problem. Archie looked as if he had more to say. She doubted she'd get it out of him in the cafe. She added, Shall we walk? They reached Little Venice and ambled along the canal. Come to the wedding, Vivian said. Luke wants you there. I know, Archie said. But, gently as she could, she touched Archie's arm and said, Are you not over Luke? They stopped walking. Archie's face confirmed a correct guess. Archie. Vivian hugged him. Archie, look at me. Luke is some guy with a job. Okay, but I'm also some guy with a job. No, you're you. So what will we do? Archie turned to Vivian with a determinedly casual smile. You've got the wedding. I was only going for entertainment. You can entertain me instead. I want to go now. You know, put the full stop on it. Vivian sighed. None of you learn. Learn what? Let me drum this into your eejit head. The good Lord gets us over people when we get away. Cut ties. Stop dilly-dallying into their lives like a semi-neglectful godparent. Foolishness. But if you want to go... She held out her arm. Let's go. Dapper, Vivian told Luke. Forty minutes to go. Luke stood with Vivian and Sean in a small bright room at the back of the church. When she'd left his hotel room and he told her he was definitely going ahead with the ceremony, she texted back a reproach. You are actually insane. But seemed to have forgiven him. That was Vivian for you. Shocked or amused at her aunt farm's locomotions. But never angry. Never scared. In any case, Vivian had assigned herself the task of critiquing Luke's tux. I await your comments, he told her. First note, Vivian said. Yeah? Would be the coffee stain. He couldn't believe it. His eyes hadn't left his Americano the entire time he'd been drinking it. 
But there the blot was, right on his chest. Don't touch it, Vivian said. You'll make it worse. Sean, get vinegar. Or vodka works. Where? Use your phone. Before Sean was out of eyesight, let alone earshot, Vivian added, There's learned helplessness, and then there's can't even teach themselves that much. How long have I got? Luke said. I don't know. Tech Celine. Then Luke was alone. He took off his shirt and scratched at the coffee stain. Celine had texted saying she was 10 minutes away, which meant at least 20. Her whole family was like that. They claimed it was an Irish thing, forgetting Luke lived and worked in Ireland and had seen for himself that some Irish people arrived on time. His bride had shown him her dress back in the Dublin flat at number 23. It was her grandmother's from the 60s. It had those vintage t-shirt looking sleeves, an off-white sheen and a crochet bodice. At a distance, it resembled a cotton thing with cutouts that Celine had worn the night she'd given Luke the Mozart mug. Maybe when she'd walk down the aisle, he'd see her. That Celine. She'd step through the church doors. He'd turn. And there she'd be. And closer she'd walk to him. And she'd be near. Until she wasn't chemistry or chance, but an actual person. The hair had risen on his arms. He twisted his ring. Paste. Twist. Pace. Twist. Pace. Shirt stuck to his back. Sweating buckets. Christ. Thirty minutes left. A knock on the door and Vivian's voice. Guess who? You? Luke said. Guess who else? The door opened, revealing Archie. Abba played in the bridal limousine. Celine saw the stave in her head. In her beaded white purse were the two broken swan halves. She'd wrapped each half in a sock to protect her hands and wore satin gloves for good measure. The glass couldn't hurt her. Vivian led Archie in to swap shirts with Luke. I'll preserve your modesty, she said, and closed the door and stood outside and waited. Luke and Archie said nothing for a while. Finally, Archie spoke. I might. I think you'd better borrow someone else's shirt. Wait, Luke said. I'm glad you came. Vivian wrote me into it. Archie, Luke said. Can we talk? Right, but, Archie said, and paused. Aren't you getting married? About that, Luke said. Once Archie plainly wouldn't be responding, Luke continued. I'm not sure. Archie still said nothing. About getting married, Luke said. More silence. And eventually Luke said, Honestly, I'm not great at knowing what I want. Archie gave a sharp laugh. I'll have to disagree with you there, old brick. I've spent a long time in denial, but it's always been gloriously, manifestly observable what you wanted. You want what we've been doing up until now. You told me as much ten years ago. I should have listened. I'm sorry. Only because you're finally having to decide. Now Luke could no longer contain his panic. But if we didn't have to choose, too late. Where I was a few months ago, or even a few weeks ago, you could have met me there. Even this morning, you could have had me. But nobody stands still forever. Archie, tell me and I'll... Don't! I'll not waste your time promising I'll change, Luke said. You can't believe me, I don't expect you to. But if you might change, Archie said. I wouldn't bet money on it, so I'm not going to bet my life. Luke said nothing at first. Then, 
I did tell you. What? Archie said. Nothing. Repeat to me what you said. It's... I did tell you I'm not good with relationships. See, Luke? Archie said. The idea of you I loved. He was an idiot, but he cared. You. You're nothing. You don't mind if I'm hurt. You just mind being blamed. Archie left through the interior door. It slammed, or it didn't. Luke and Archie said nothing for a while. Finally, Luke said, There's something Selim once told me about every relationship needing a harmony and a melody. And you can't just have a melody. He spoke as if recalling what he'd already explained to himself. And something else about, honestly, I'm not sure she agrees with me on this. But commitment isn't something you can just will yourself into. Like piano. It takes hard work. And that bit you choose. But you also have to want it. And it's not your fault if you don't. Quite. Only I'm not sure why you're so keen to convince me. Archie said, not unkindly. I mean, fair, Luke said. It's something I've been... You know, whether we've got... Celine hates this word, but the talent to make it work. Anyway, we'll find out. That's all anyone can expect from marriage. Finding out. She's nearly here, Archie said. Chop, chop. A pause, during which the men presumably changed shirts. Then Luke stepped out into the church. Or he didn't. The first outcome was possible. So was the second. But with her ear close to the door, not against, she did have standards. Vivian heard the following. Luke and Archie said nothing for a while. Finally, Archie spoke. I might... I think you'd better borrow someone else's shirt. Wait, Luke said. And his phone rang. Three rings. Then Luke told Archie, It's Lean. You might want... Roger. Archie left and closed the door behind him. When he saw Vivian, he raised his eyebrows. Vivian smiled back at him from one side of her mouth. They stayed there in silence outside the groom's room. Luke's phone was ringing through the wall. They heard a pause. Then, Celine. They'd reached the church. Five minutes late. Etta James as at last played as the limousine pulled in. But Celine still had Abba in her head. Party horns, laugh, click, horn, laugh, click. And she wanted this. She did. But she was wretched from the lies. Luke was waiting in the church. And it was too late. And she had to marry him now. It would be the greatest lie she'd ever told. And to the largest audience. And the rest of her life would proceed from that lie. She clasped her fingers around her purse. Around the broken swan. Would you hurry, Celine? Phoebe stuck her head back into the limo. Just a minute, Celine said, and beckoned her sister into the car. Celine, Phoebe said. What's the crack? Nothing, Celine said. Just when you asked me before, I've changed my mind. I want to know. So Phoebe told her. Chords sounded from the church. Camera clicked, horns blared, confetti flew and Phoebe held Celine's hand and Celine held her purse which in turn held shattered glass. You go out and explain, Celine told Phoebe. Then Celine picked up her phone. 8pm, rooftop restaurant, 20 storeys high. Grelin had seen his niece earlier at the reception. She still wore her dress and had headed straight for the bar. A true McGaw. Alcohol, the last stop on any flowchart. Possibly she was still drinking in the corner. 
a decent hoolie considering, and mostly Maggie's doing. It's a blinder you're after pulling, Grelin yelled to Maggie from across the bench. Chano Hames was made. I'd be speaking generally, Grelin said, but the usual thing before a reception would be to have a wedding. Ah, now, Maggie said, gin on the house and no priesting. There's hard cells and there's piss easy. By the by, have you seen Celine? Chatting to your man, Luke's friend. After her phone call with Luke, Celine had left the church alone to buy vodka in Tesco Express. Then she'd kept walking along the road. A policeman had narrowed his eyes at her as she swigged from the bottle. But he'd said nothing. How must she have looked to him? Wedding dress. Smeared off. No man. As it should be. After a nice long stroll, she joined the reception. Phoebe had met her at the door and piloted her through to the bar, fending off inquiries. Then Celine sat and drank alone. She left her bridal purse on the stool beside her and nobody dared ask to sit there for some time. Finally, Archie did, but she hadn't objected. They've been talking for hours now and we're still on the topic of Luke. Part of me thinks I can make him commit, Archie said. Celine sipped water. You can't, and if you could, then you wouldn't. Vivian said something. Let me remember. It was... Luke's just some guy with a job. We're lab rats. You give us anxiety over something and we conclude it must be worth having. Their peanuts arrived. Luke had been right about one thing. Celine was warming to Archie after all. She didn't do enough of that, did she? Enjoy people. They'd met at the Hyde Park entrance off Upper Brook Street. Celine had arrived in her wedding dress. Luke was still in a suit as well, and strangers gave them encouraging smiles as they walked across the grounds. We need to decide things, Celine said. Things? Flat. Cat. OK, Luke said. So since you're taking the honeymoon, I should probably go back to number 23 and move my things out. I'll take Madame Esmeralda with me. Thank God, Celine said. I love her, but she'd die. If she stayed with you? Yes, honestly true. Shut up, she said. It was the most relaxed he'd felt around her in well over a year. Celine added, You keep the flat, though. I mean, Luke said, This is all my fault. I left you because of shit I've done. I didn't want to get married, Celine said. The shit you've done just forced the issue. They'd reached the Serpentine Bridge in the park. The river flowed under five arches of honey-coloured stone. Tourists thronged along the parapet while cyclists raced past. The sky was clear. Celine leaned towards the water, exhaled slowly and held out a white purse in her satin-gloved hands. This is silly, but... But what? Luke said. Did I tell you I dropped a swan? Celine opened her purse, unfolded what appeared to be socks, and showed him two shattered pieces of glass. One of Maggie's swans, she said. I flew off the piano. I thought maybe I'd glue it back together, but... I mean, two swans stay together for life, Luke said but I'm not sure about two halves of one swan. They don't always stay together. Swans divorce. Really? Usually from failure to breed. Luke couldn't help laughing. Ever the romantic. Can we drop it in the river? Celine said. That's a nice thought, isn't it? Letting the halves bob away. Reality is they'll slit a duck's throat. They retraced their steps since they'd seen rubbish bins earlier along the path. I guess, Celine said, you could argue that recycling is romantic. You'll lose everything you love, but the love comes back in another form, etc. You can't recycle broken glass, Luke said. Stop. Safety reasons. Fine, 
Celine said. I'll fix the swan. Now they'd reached one of the park's entrance gates. They hugged and her head folded tidily below his chin. For a moment he thought she'd look up, but her eyes stayed downcast. When they broke the embrace, she nearly dropped her bridal purse. By reflex, he grasped for it. No need. She'd caught it herself. Best of luck, Luke said. He nearly said, with the swan. But he meant, best of luck with everything. You too, she told him. They said goodbye.